thanks Professor Huayda and the organizing committee for this fruitful conference and for being here. And let me uh, present my patient. She is a 22 year old single female student in her last year at the Faculty of Pharmacy with negative consanguinity of her parents. She gave a history of left lower limb DVT that was diagnosed two years before her current presentation with no further investigations. I was kept on a low molecular weight heparin and then shifted to one of the direct acting oral anticoagulant with Aruxipan 10 milligram. And she was kept on it for about one year. I was stopped spontaneously without any further medical reconsultation. Few weeks before her presentation, she complained of polyarthritis of small joints of both hands and bilateral wrists joints and was diagnosed with seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. At the time, with her serological markers were negative, negative rheumatoid factor and negative NCCP. She has been prescribed the following medications, Plazucar 30 milligram per day for about two weeks and stopped five days before the presentation and hydroquine 20 milligram twice daily and mesotrexate 12.5 milligram per week. And she received just two doses and last one was one week before the current presentation. Why she was diagnosed by a rheumatology team, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis based on the 2020 ECR ULR classification for rheumatoid arthritis. She have more than 10, milligram, uh, 10 joints, at least one small joint and this score for five. And serologically, there was negative rheumatoid arthritis uh, factor and negative NCCP in this score for zero. And regarding the acute phase reactant, she has abnormal ESR at the time in this score for one. And her symptoms were for more than six weeks and this score for one. So her total score were seven and this go for the criteria for diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis at that time without any further investigation. She presented this time to us with dyspnea that was associated with orthopnea, arthralgia with bilateral lower limb pitting edema, epigastric pain with vomiting and the vaginal pleading that was annoying here several days before the presentation, spontaneous ecomotic patches scattered all over the body. On examination, she was, um, her glasgoma scale was 15 over 15 with blood pressure 130 over 80, pulse was 90 per beat per minute, temperature 38, and hair saturation was 90%, 98% in room air with lymphadenopathy in cervical and axillary lymph nodes and mouse ulcers with no significant hair loss. Abdominal examination was unremarkable except for tenderness over the epigastric region. Her chest and heart, there was ejection systolic murmur and fine crackles over the right lung. Musculoskeletal assessment, post hands and wrist joints were tender without swelling nor limitation of for her, uh, her, her movement. The laboratory investigation of the presentation, there was anemia, normocytic, normochromic anemia and thrombocytopenia, homoglobin was seven and platelet count was 49. Total exotic count showed leukopenia with 2.54 and PT at that time was over 60 and I think this was a false reading as confirmatory reading was within normal range. Serum creatinine was 1.85 and serum Serum potassium was six. Her ESR at that time was 95 and EBG show metabolic acidosis. Imaging on presentation. We have high resolution CT chest with evidence of bilateral areas of consolidation with increased septal thickening and no gross active areas of ground glass opacities. Venous doubler of both lower limbs. There was no evidence of acute DVT. Belvi abdominal ultrasound was unremarkable and rapid study of echocardiography show preserved systolic function with ejection fraction 63% and diastolic dysfunction grade three, mitral regurgitation grade three, tricuspid regurgitation grade one and pulmonary artery pressure was 50 millimeter mercury. We have a multidisciplinary team assessment for the patient. Pulmonology team have the impression of pulmonary congestion based on bilateral lower limb edema, presence of Hypertension, CT findings that go according to their assessment more with congestion 
Her saturation was 93% in supine position and 97% in setting rheumatology team assessment. They want to confirm the diagnosis of systemic lupus and may be associated with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and want to exclude pulmonary embolism or infection by the uh, pulmonology team and want to start with steroid therapy. And this was based on the previous history of DVT regarding their thinking about association of antiphospholipid. Hematology team, they need to correct the anemia and encourage hydration with antimicrobial coverage and asking for the autoimmune markers. And they ask for bone marrow aspect if there is no improvement or no clear diagnosis for the patient. Our team has the impression of um, Mostly this go with systemic lupus and may be associated with antiphospholipid antibody. Our evidence were based on arthritis, arthralgia, presence of pancytopenia, renal impairment, and acute phase reactant. And our decision to have antimicrobial coverage is starting oral steroids and ask for the autoimmune markers and consider renal biopsy if more deterioration of renal function or presence of proteinuria. During the admission, her fluid chart is here. The blue column is for fluid intake and the gray one for urine output. At start, there was, uh, there was the rigoria and then gradually improved. And at the end, there was negative balance. Regarding the vital signs, we start with fever. The purple line is for the highest reading per day and the red one is for the lowest reading per day. And at the start, there was fever, as we see, and then gradually there was no fever at the end. Her blood pressure all the time was ranging from 100 over 60 to 130 over 80. And the hair pulse was within accepted range. Her random blood sugar readings were all over the duration of admission. These are readings per day. We have sometimes readings that go for 184 and 20, uh, 200 and 186, and this was elevated. So we consider close monitoring of random blood sugar, especially after initiation of the pulse steroid. Hemoglobin level as a sort was seven and was normocytic, normochromic all over the course of admission. And we have a reticulocytic count of 1%. We have two packed RPCs blood transfusion during the admission and gradual improvement of hemoglobin and at the end, her hemoglobin was 9.2. Total leukocytic count during the admission, we start with leukopenia of 2.5. And then all the time there was leukopenia, but after steroid pulse, there was improvement with uh, total leukocytic count reaching 4, 5.5, and at the end, 5.9. With lymphopenia, many times. Lately count at the start was 49 and gradually increasing then fluctuating to decrease again. And at least at the last, we reached 320 and then 3 uh, 307. Serum creatinine, the red line shows the serum potassium and the blue one is for serum creatinine. We start with serum creatinine of 1.8, increasing gradually to reach 2.6 and then gradual decline again to reach 1.4 at the end. Serum potassium, sometimes there was uh, hyperkalemia, but improved by the end. Other operatory investigation, serum sodium was in the accepted ranges during the admission, also PTINR and PTT. ST was 64 for one time, ALT was 47, serum albumin was two, then 2.9, 3.5, and at the end, it reaches 3.7. LEDH was 190, and uh, unfortunately, it was done for uh, one time and not repeated again. Serum calcium, total serum calcium was 7.6, and then improved to 8.7. With normal ionized and phosphorus uh, uric acid, AMP, uh, ABG was uh, there was metabolic acidosis at the start and then improved at the end. Bleeding time for first time was eight and then improved to five. Protein excretion during the admission, 
we started with albumin creatinine excretion of uh, nearly two grams per day. Then another reading was 880 and then 100 and a half nearly per day. Then 24 protein, hour for protein excretion was 1,885. Uh, and at the end before discharge, it reaches 680. Urine analysis show protein plus two and past cells of 25 to 30. RPCs were 15 to 20. PCR for COVID was done um, at the start of admission and was negative. Protein C and protein S were normal. CRP was 96. ESR at the start, their first hour was 85 and second hour was over 100. And later on, become first hour 13 and second hour was 22. Regarding the autoimmune markers, we have a positive ANA, anti double strand DNA, and consume T3 and C4 with negative lupus, anticoagulant, and C, anti anti-CCP, and rheumatoid factor. And we uh, ask it for doing anti uh, beta 2 glycoprotein on antibodies and the anti cardiolipin but was, uh, there was no availability for them at our hospital. Why this patient could be systemic lupus based on uh, 2019 ELR ECR new classification criteria? We have a positive ANA with additive criteria showing fever that score for two, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia. We have uh, uh, oral ulcers, and also there was joint involvement with proteinuria more than half gram per 24 hour positive uh, anti-DNA and consumed C3 and C4. So her total score was 31, and this met our criteria for systemic lupus. Why may be associated with antiphospholipid antibody? We just have, according to the revised criteria, venous thrombosis event that happened once, without any evidence for laboratory criteria. So we are not confirmed about association of antiphospholipid antibody. Our management plan, she was kept starting with prednisolone 10 milligram and then received five IV mini pulses of a steroid with a total dose of 1,250 milligram with uh, supportive measures, calcium, neurovit, folic acid, and proton pump. We have IV diuretics and also coverage with third generation kephalosporin. Patient was improved and renal biopsy was done and we were waiting for the biopsy result. So she were, was discharged for follow-up and bringing her uh, biopsy results. She was vitally stable by that time and laboratory investigation on discharge, her hemoglobin reached 9.2, total leukocytic count 5.9, and platelet count 307, serum alpon of 3.7, serum calcium 8.7, serum creatine 1.4, serum potassium 4.5, alpon creatine excretion 680, and EBG was normal, is our first hour 13 and second hour 22. Patient was discharged on the following drugs. We um, also uh, prescribed prednisolone 60 milligram per day, um, prophylactic anticoagulation with rivaroxaban 10 milligram per day, calcium, uh, neurovit folic acid, and proton pump, Lasix uh, 20 milligram per day, and the issue protein 4,000 international unit twice a week. Four days after discharge, she started to develop bilateral lower limb edema with venous doubler or post lower limb was done again without any evidence of recent thrombosis. And more uh, two days, she complained of ecomotic patches again all over the body and dyspnea or sopnia epistaxis with massive bilateral lower limb edema. She was admitted to the ICU unit at another hospital with more deterioration of her general condition with bleeding through all orifices, hematemsis, hemopsis, melina, vaginal bleeding, and epistaxis. And she developed hypoxia, so she was intubated and maintained on the mechanical ventilator. Her investigation as reported to us, hemoglobin was 8.2, total leukocytic count 24.9, and platelet count was 165, serum creatine 1.4, and other investigation with, with the normal. As reported uh, by her physician, at the time, CT chest was done and finding were compatible with intra-alveolar hemorrhage. 
biopsy result, um, we received it, but uh, it was late. Here, um, hematopsin and leucine show endocapillary proliferation with glomerular hypercellularity, occasional neutrophils with thickening of glomerular placement membrane, focal intraglomerular sclerotic areas with topular degenerative changes, thickening of the glomerular placement membrane with wire loop formation, and microstrom pi within the glomerular capillaries and topular degenerative changes also. And here, the arteriodes show endothelial swelling, fragmented RPCs, and five pins from pi. With the silver stain, here there is a thickening of glomerular basement membrane with mesangial cellularity with mesangial matrix expansion. So the findings were compatible with lupus glomerular class four with activity index eight over 24 and without coronacity uh, in the biopsy with association of thrombotic microangiopathy. Examination of the biopsy 25 glomeruli were seen, out of which none was globally sclerosed, with most glomeruli show endocapillary hypercellularity with occasional neutral fields, frequent of intracellular deposits with high lines from pi and serial crescents in two glomeruli. Focal mesangiolysis with higher uh, from pi were, was also noted. To pure through mild injury, interstitium was within normal limits. Arteries with were unremarkable, while the RTU show um, endothelial swelling, grid cell fragmentation, and five prints from pi. Congrade was uh, negative for amyloid deposits. Immunohistochemistry, we have um, IgA, IgG, and C3, segmental glomerular basement membrane, and focal mesangial deposits. And based on what our patient may be the thrombotic diagnosis of thrombotic microangiopathy, presence of thrombocytopenia with a platelet count was 45 at the start, with hemoglobin was seven, plus renal impairment, there was elevated serum creatinine and decreased GFR and abnormal urine analysis. Also, there was abdominal pain and vomiting at the start. Unfortunately, the patient died one day post admission in the ICU before the biopsy report was received. So in our practice, we may have one uh, disease entity and sometimes we have more than one disease entity as here in our patient, there was lupus nephritis and renal thrombo thrombotic microangiopathy uh, diagnosed by the histopathology and probability of presence of antiphospholipid Maybe. I'll end with this quote. Diagnosis is not the end, but the beginning of the practice. Thank you.